Hey, thanks. Um, so thank you for um, inviting me here. Uh, this is, uh, I think, one of the standard, has become one of the standard seminar series uh, during the pandemic. Um, and so um, uh, I wanted to tell you something about part of the research I've been involved with in the last few years. Um, this has to do with phototaxis of two microorganisms. Uh, they're both microalgae. One is Chlamydomonas and the other one is Micromonas. The first one you might already have heard uh, of or actually be familiar with. And the second one probably not so much. But before we, um, we get to the thick of it, I just wanted to mention the fact that this has been and is being um, the, the result of uh, collaboration with a bunch of amazing individuals. Um, I just wanted to highlight in particular Richard Henshaw uh, that um, was a PhD student with me and is now a postdoc with Jeff Guasto at Tufts. Uh, Raphael Genere, who is uh, um, leading his own group at uh, Ecole Normale in Paris, and Antoine Allard and Anousou Yapal, um, who are currently uh, postdocs with me and they're based at the physics department at the University of Warwick. So <clears throat> as I said before, we're going to uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, phototaxis. Um, uh, but before we, um, we start <laughs> talking about the taxi of these microorganisms, actually, I wanted to spend a, a couple of minutes trying to motivate, uh, trying to tell you a couple of things that I personally think are quite interesting about phototaxis. The first one uh, is that this is a, a, a phenomenon or a type of motility which is much, much less understood than, uh, than chemotaxis. So uh, chemotaxis uh, benefits uh, our understanding of chemotaxis benefits from several decades of uh, studies, in particular of bacterial chemotaxis, but not, not only. And these have uh, uh, essentially uh, have given as a result the fact that we know quite well uh, how chemotaxis works, in particular in bacteria, for example, uh, E. coli, uh, all the way down to molecular level. This is not really the case for phototaxis, and uh, uh, there is quite a lot of stuff that still needs to be understood. And I think there is, uh, is, is an interesting uh, topic, or at least I, I hope that I will convince you is an interesting topic for physicists. The other thing is that um, phototaxis is present both in prokaryotes and uh, eukaryotes. Um, this for me was a surprise. Um, I can understand it for eukaryotes, but prokaryotes is uh, slightly uh, less obvious uh, um, thing uh, for me. So, uh, for example, a particular, uh, an example is particularly interesting for me from the prokaryotic side is what happens with uh, Synecocystis, which is a cyanobacterium. So Synecocystis uh, manages to move towards light gliding on a surface over the course of several days. And um, it's not really clear how it, or it was at least, it wasn't really clear how it managed to de decide which is the direction that it has to, to follow in order to move towards light, right? And uh, a few years ago, um, it was shown that uh, the mechanism essentially is a combination of two elements. The first one is the gliding motility of, uh, of the cyanobacterium, which is based on type four pili. So the pili are uh, extruded, if you want, from the cell, uh, hook onto the surface, and then they're retracted. In this way, the cell manages to do essentially a random motion. And then the activity of this pili is connected with, uh, with light through micro lensing. So essentially the cell, which is a few microns um, in size, uh, lenses the incoming light in such a way that internally you have a inhomogeneity in the uh, intensity of, uh, of, of light, essentially. And here you can see that in false color in the uh, um, autofluorescence or chlorophyll autofluorescence of the cell. And you can see that there is a little um, blob, if you want, of high intensity or region of high intensity in the direction that is directly opposite to the direction that light is coming from. As you can see it here in the left and the right, and in the center here instead, you can see what happens when you have light head on, so you don't see the, uh, uh, this, this light blob. Essentially, what the cell does is it couples the activity of uh, protrusion and retraction of the pili to the local light intensity, and by doing this automatically, it manages to be more active in one of the two directions. Uh, either the one towards the light or the one uh, far from the light, in this, in this case, the one towards the light. And therefore, it, on average, it gets pushed more and more towards, uh, towards light. I think this is quite uh, 
astounding and uh, from a physical perspective is a very elegant uh, solution. Then if you step up, uh, I would say in complexity and go to uh, eukaryotic microorganisms like euglena, for example, this is uh, quite similar um, to, uh, to chlamydomonas, although uh, phylogenetically speaking is, uh, is, is far. You can see in these experiments, for example, you can see the uh, emergence of negative uh, phototaxis. So you can have accumulation of the population in a region of high concentration, sorry, of high light intensity, but then if the light intensity becomes too large, then you see the development of this dip, which means that the cells actually um, try to flee from that from the part. So they don't really want to have uh, intensity uh, of light, which is too high. And then you can go all the way to, uh, you can step up if you want in complexity and go to um, organisms that have multiple cells. So like Volvox, for example, uh, and in this case, the, the, the next problem that they need to, uh, uh, to sort of solve is how to coordinate the phototactic activity or the motile activity of all the different cells that compose the microorganism. Um, obviously, if you go all, one step up yet, uh, you get to, uh, for example, animals, but then in this case, then you start to have eyes with uh, neurons and neuronal um, modulation of uh, flagellar activity. And this is completely different uh, uh, type of, uh, of problem if you want. So this at the moment for me, for example, I'm not particularly interested in that. I'm more interested in this level. Okay, so let's start with, uh, with clammy. Uh, I would argue that phototaxis is best understood in chlamydomonas actually uh, amongst the uh, uh, microalgae. So let's try to um, understand in a nutshell what is known uh, or the main ingredients of what is known uh, of uh, phototaxis in clammy. So you have two, um, two things at play here. One is the flagella, so the propulsion, and the other one is the so-called eye spot. So the flagella are typical eukaryotic flagella. I remind you that eukaryotic flagella are different from bacterial flagella. They have the same name, but it's a completely different uh, object. It's like saying, I don't know, one is a boat and the other one is a house. Um, so um, eukaryotic flagella in this case are uh, about 10 microns long. You can have smaller ones, they're called cilia, that are two, three microns, a few microns long. They have a typical beating frequency of a few tens of hertz. And um, in this case, they propel the microorganism uh, at typical, spe typical speeds of order of 10 body lengths per second. So about 100 microns a second, because the body of, uh, of chlamydomonas is about 10 microns. The eye spot uh, you might be slightly less familiar with um, is a very interesting region from a physical perspective. And uh, I'm happy to talk about it uh, slightly more detail later, but for what concerns us now, um, it has uh, essentially two roles. The first one is the detection uh, of light. It's, a, it's like a one pixel camera, if you want. And the second one is the fact that it acts as uh, a mirror, a uh, concentrating mirror for light that comes from the front of the eye spot. And it acts as a screen for light that comes from the back of, uh, of, of the eye spot. So um, essentially what this does is, uh, is it, it enhances the contrast um, of uh, between the light coming from one side and light coming from the other side of the cell. So this, enhance, this enhancement in contrast, contrast is coupled to motility in order to achieve phototaxis through the fact that the cell spins. Okay, so uh, as it moves, uh, this microorganism, as well as many other microorganisms, uh, spins. It spins at about a couple of hertz. And the reason why it spins is, um, is due to the misalignment of the beating planes of the two flagella. So if you want to know more uh, about this from a quantitative uh, perspective, I suggest you um, read this very nice publication from last year by Dario Cortese and Kirsty Wong. So how is spinning related to uh, phototaxis? Well, um, the thing is the following, the mechanism is the following. If the cell is moving towards light, as it, the cell spins, the light stimulus that is perceived by the eye is constant. So the constancy of the light stimulus essentially means no extra modulation of flagellar activity. If, however, the cell is moving at an angle with respect to light, uh, in this case, for example, 90 degrees, as the cell spins, the light stimulus received by eye spot uh, is modulated in time, right? In this case, um, by um, with the modulation of two hertz. 
So this modulation induces uh, a modulation in, uh, in flagellar activity. So that, for example, if you want to achieve positive phototaxis, as the uh, um, stimulus grows, you will, uh, you will modulate the activity of the transflagellum, which is the flagellum further from the eye spot, in such a way that it, in a sense, beats, quote unquote, stronger, meaning it generates a higher torque. Uh, if instead the, uh, um, the stimulus is decreasing, now is the turn of the cis flagellum, which is the flagellum towards the eye, to generate a higher torque. And the net result of this is that regardless of the phase in the spinning cycle, the cell will still, will always uh, tend to reorient towards the light. If you reverse this and the, for growing stimulus, you uh, stimulate the cis flagellum and for decreasing stimulus, you stimulate uh, the uh, trans flagellum, more then the cell manages to do negative phototaxis. So in a sense, in a sense is a simple, uh, um, is a simple device. Uh, the uh, biological implementation is not as trivial, but I mean, conceptually is not that, that, that difficult to understand, but it manages actually to generate um, quite interesting uh, patterns. So this, for example, um, is, uh, it's an example of photo-induced bio, photo bioconvection. So what you have here are two small drops. They are a fifth of a milliliter. Um, and I placed these uh, suspensions of cells on top of a, of a screen that can be turned on. So the, uh, the, so the, the, the cells in the suspension in the drop are uniformly distributed when the light is off. And then when the light is turned on, they generate these nice, um, these nice patterns. So we were actually fascinated by uh, these patterns. It was actually a completely uh, serendipitous um, uh, well, discovery for me. I mean, these things were known, but for me it was a serendipitous discovery whilst I was doing an experiment. I was like, what is this? So just, uh, I'm just pointing this out because um, serendipitous discoveries are actually quite, uh, can be quite interesting. Um, so we decided to uh, um, sort of try to analyze the phototactic behavior at the population level in slightly more detail. So in order to do that, and uh, for the moment not be bothered by uh, bioconvection, so bothered by gravity, what we decided to do is to use a Healy Shaw cell, which is a thin and wide uh, chamber. This is held horizontally in this case. It's filled with algae, which are the little white specks that you can see here. Uh, this is an image in dark field. That's why the cells look uh, bright on a black background. And then you have an, an optical fiber and um, in this way, what you can do is you can turn on the fiber and uh, then turn it off. So when you turn it on, uh, the light attracts the, the cells. Uh, they accumulate around the, uh, the optical fiber, then you turn it off, and then you get this uh, essentially relaxation of, uh, of the blob. So you can, do, you can repeat this over and over and over in order to get statistics and analyze um, with this the behavior of uh, the phototactic behavior at the population level. So the way we, um, we did this is uh, to use essentially the integrated image intensity within a disk um, of radius rho around centered uh, at the location of the uh, optical fiber. Obviously we did all the tests to check that, the, um, that this was a, a signal that was linear in the cell concentration. So um, this is an example of a curve of the accumulation and dispersal uh, appropriately massaged. Um, so what you see here is the initial accumulation of the cells where the light is turned on, then the light is turned off, and then you get the dispersal. So you can do repeatedly accumulation dispersal and look at this type of, these types of curves as a function of rho. So um, we got two main um, outcomes or two main things measured from, from these curves. The first one uh, from the relaxation is the effective diffusivity at the population level. So this is, these are an example of the results that we got. So we have an average diffusivity, which matches uh, well with uh, uh, other results from, uh, from literature, which were, measured, were measuring the diffusivity in, uh, in a different way. So that for us means that we were not doing anything egregiously stupid. Um, and then on the other side, you cannot, we can measure from the beginning, from the accumulate, accumulation side of the curve, you can measure the phototactic speed uh, of the population as a function of rho, so as a function of distance from the optical fiber. 
and therefore as a function of uh, local profiling light intensity. So in these experiments, what we found out is that the uh, um, response, the phototactic response of the cells was proportional to the local gradient in light intensity, which was a little bit of a, of a surprise to us. So by doing this, then the first thing that comes to mind then is to um, sort of put together the diffusivity and the drift into what essentially is a chemotaxis to light model, okay? So this is a 2D uh, Keller-Siegel type model where you have that the accumulation of the cells depends on the balance between diffusive flux and an advective flux. Now within this, the advective flux depends on the local phototactic speed, which depends on, on the gradient in light intensity and is proportional to that. And with a proportionality factor that depends on the swimming speed of the cells and this parameter beta, which we uh, call the uh, uh, phototactic uh, sensitivity. So the sensitivity parameter. So these two parameters we measured independently uh, in uh, single cell experiments, which unfortunately I will not have time to, uh, to talk about. But just to say that these are not fitted parameters uh, in, uh, uh, the, in, in the model, okay? So these are parameters we measure independently. The only fitted parameter is this um, size H, which should be equivalent to the size of the, uh, uh, the thickness of the Hedishaw cell. So with, that, uh, with this sort of model, actually we managed to uh, um, fit quite well the process of accumulation and uh, dispersal of the, uh, uh, of the profiles, not just at the, uh, at the population level, but also um, because thankfully is, uh, is the same, the, um, is the same as population at the single cell level, also the concentration profile that we get from uh, pulling together all the positions of the cells that we get at the individual cell level in a much lower uh, uh, concentration. So meaning that the population level that we, uh, uh, the population behavior that we observe is actually still in, a, in the dilute regime, if you think about it. So um, we then went on and used this uh, in, uh, um, if you want, as a predictor of what would happen if you were to move or reorient the Healy show cell uh, vertically, because then at that point, gravity starts to play a role as well. And if you do that, then what you can do is you can elicit the uh, um, development of uh, local, a local photobioconvective plume, which can then be used, for example, to mix the, uh, the suspension. So um, again, um, because I, this is just half of the talk, I uh, decided that I'm not gonna tell you much more about this, except that the beha this behavior actually is captured very well by the, uh, 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 the model that I just uh, uh, explained before. But if you want to know more, we, uh, uh, we published this uh, a couple of years ago, well, a year and a half ago. Okay, so, um, uh, one thing that I wasn't completely honest about is that um, I didn't tell you that in the um, in the this um, accumulation and dispersals actually there is a little bit of uh, uh, of an aging in the response. Meaning, at the very beginning when you do the repeats, the response is uh, has a higher intensity and then it plateaus down to a steady state. So we were uh, quite intrigued by this. So what determines the adaptation? So we tried to uh, think about it uh, a little bit, sort of guessing, doing an educated guess. And it turns out it's not changes in uh, cell speed. Uh, this would be due to a thing that's called photokinesis. And it's also not due to a, a higher proportion of negatively phototactic cells. Um, instead, what we found out is the following. So um, from, a, from the point of view of the model, the, the adaptation in the curves that we saw before is uh, captured by um, a variation in time or an adaptation in time of the sensitivity parameter, this parameter beta, that tells me essentially the proportion of the swimming speed of the cells that the cells can devote to um, phototaxis essentially. So you can see that this has an adaptation uh, which is captured with time, which is, ca which is captured quite well by an exponential. This exponential that, uh, that determines the adaptation of the sensitivity parameter actually is very similar to the ex this, this exponential here. So this curve here is the chlorophyll autofluorescence of cells which were exposed to the same 
um, cycle, series of cycles of, uh, of uh, illumination. And they really are the same. So these are completely different uh, uh, measurements, meaning they measure different things. One is motility, the other one is uh, essentially as a proxy for uh, photosynthetic uh, activity, but they do uh, scale or they do adapt uh, to light in the same, with the same dynamics. And for us, this was, uh, was quite um, an, an interesting uh, clue that perhaps there is a quantitative dependence or there can be a quantitative dependence of phototaxis on photosynthetic activity. So in a sense, the idea is that the phototactic motility uh, through, can modulate the light exposure of the cell and therefore can change the chloroplast activity. The, the chloroplast activity uh, itself then um, can regulate the flagellar response and therefore change the phototactic motility of the cell. So in a sense, the motility and the metabolism uh, of the cell needs to be um, understood altogether in order to really to understand phototaxis. So we are currently exploring this with uh, Antoine and Anusuya. Uh, and in particular, Antoine has put together a nice setup where you combine micro manipulation of the cells with eye stimulation, um, visualized through an infrared illumination. So this does not elicit uh, photosynthesis together with a, a back coupled uh, uh, optical tweezer, which can be modulated. And we use that to uh, uh, essentially modulate the light exposure to the chloroplast only. So in a sense, the chloroplast sees one intensity of light, but the eye spot sees another intensity of light. And this way you can hopefully decouple the uh, um, responses, the flagellar responses that are due to adaptation of the eye, so of the camera, to flagellar responses that are uh, uh, that change due to um, really metabolic changes in metabolic activity of the cell. Uh, so we have five minutes left. All right, thanks. So we don't really know whether this uh, wh where this will uh, will bring us, but uh, stay tuned. Okay, so now we switch gears and we go um, to Micromonas because Micromonas um, is intriguing because it manages to do uh, phototaxis, but it only has one flagellum, not two. So how does it manage to do phototaxis? So Micromonas is a picoeukaryote, so it's as big as a bacterium. It's an interesting um, species from, a, uh, from an ecological perspective because it's, a, a, it's, a, it's considered the dominant picoeukaryote across many regions, many seas in the world. And it has been poised as being one of the, uh, uh, in some of them has been poised to be one of the regulators of bacterial abundance. Okay, so it's a, it's a so-called is a mixotroph. Um, so this actually is quite interesting because I mean I don't know from a predator prey perspective is I think is an interesting thing that possibly we will explore explore in the future. It has a um, peculiar flagell flagellum, so it has a normal nine plus two uh, flagellum at the base, but then it has a central pair that uh, elongates quite a lot, so there several microns, and this can be rotated by the activity of the flagellum at the base. Uh, in order to move either clockwise or counterclockwise, and this essentially propels the cell forward or backward. In a sense, can be both a pusher and a puller. Has been reported in the 60s as doing positive, sorry, strong phototaxis uh, in a paper by Mantle and Park, and that's pretty much it. That's what we know about its phototaxis. So we decided to uh, look at it from um, uh, in two ways, one at the population level and the other one at the single cell level. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the population level, and then I'll skip uh, to uh, the, the crooks at the, um, at the single cell level. So the population level, we look essentially at the accumulation of cells towards the side of our chamber that, uh, is, that faces the, uh, the light stimulus. Long story short, we get a uh, drift, which is essentially constant as a function of the ranging intensities that we uh, explored. So normal daylight is about here. And also as a function of color. And this tells us um, a few things. The first thing is the smallest, well, it's a question mark actually, why do we bother having such a small drift as like a couple of microns per minute? Uh, the second one is the fact that there, there isn't really any type of pattern is telling us that um, is, we, it can be understood as an all or none type of, uh, of, uh, of response, 
and has to be responsible, has to be elicited by um, stimuli from detected from a wide spectrum of phytochromes. So the type of motion is essentially, essentially a series of run, stop, and reverse. Okay, so we can uh, analyze this in, uh, in several details as uh, the stop motion is a Poisson process. The reorientations can be understood in terms of a, essentially an active reorientation and, uh, and all this. But what about phototaxis? So in a nutshell, after more than a million trajectories, because the phototaxis is not as, as strong as was reported, um, what we can say is that the cell essentially uh, manages to do a slightly more a slightly elongated run when it manages to move towards, when it happens to be moving towards light. This has to be, this is the, um, uh, the length of the runs as a function of orientation. And you can see that there is a peak in the direction towards light, which is, uh, which we don't see in the control. So if we sort of um, put down a putative response, uh, trying to sweep away the noise, we can understand this as a, as a, uh, a fixed average at about uh, 4.1 microns for the runs. And then there is this sort of Gaussian blob, uh, Gaussian peak, which is just a quarter of a micron longer uh, with a width of about 40 degrees. So the cell manages to see where the light is coming from with a precision of about 40 degrees. Um, and using this putative response, you can estimate that the phototactic drift should be about, about 1.6 microns per minute, which for this intensity and color matches what we see in the experiments. I'm bringing this, so um, I, I wanted to say two things. The first one is the smallest of the um, phototactic drift actually matches the uh, sedimentation speed of the cells. Okay, so we have a idea for why you would bother doing such a small uh, uh, response and why actually is an all or none response. By doing that, you can stay afloat. Essentially, this is the idea. And then what about the, uh, the precision in the light direction? Well, this links to how is the light direction detected in the first place? And it turns out that Micromonas has no eye spot. However, it manages to do uh, or it does uh, cell lensing in a similar way uh, to uh, the Senecocystis that we discussed before. I remind you Senecocystis is a bacterium. This is not a bacterium, okay? This is a, is a eukaryotic cell. So what you see here is a similar uh, experiment to the Isenicocystis one. So you have the cell with the light that comes from one side, and you can see in false color that the uh, local intensity, intracellular intensity of light, you, we use as a proxy uh, the uh, uh, chlorophyll autofluorescence, is peaked uh, in the opposite side of the cell from the, uh, from the side the light is coming from. And it turns out that if you look at the profile of light inten intensity here, is a profile that has really a width of 40 uh, degrees. So in a sense, what we put forward then here is that there is a, um, there is a link between this, the width of this patch and the width of the phototaxis, phototaxis peak. In a sense, um, possibly the cell uh, manages or uses the local intracellular light intensity as a, to, in order to modulate a little bit the flagellar activity. And therefore the precision with, we, with which it manages to move towards light is essentially due to physics because it's due to how tight the light, the plane wave that comes from one side manages to get squeezed in within the lens. So with this, I'm just gonna put the conclusions up. I wanted to thank the, uh, um, the, the funders. And actually, if I can, just I wanted to uh, um, publicize the fact that we are organizing a, um, a, uh, a conference in Mallorca. Um, this is a series of conferences uh, every two years, one time in the States and one time in, uh, elsewhere. In this case, this year is in Mallorca. There is still um, time to apply. Deadline is February the 20th. Thank you, Marco, Thanks. for a wonderful talk. So we have time for one or two questions. I don't see any questions in the chat. If you have a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask directly. Ming Ming, yes. Thank you. Uh, this is a wonderful talk. Uh, sorry, I was literally. Um, 
I I thought the the part that you talking about uh, um, uh, motility and uh, um, uh, taxes and the metabolic pathway the interaction that's really fascinating because uh, um, I know a lot of faculty members here at Cornell are interested in um, exploiting the metabolic pathway to produce you know, things uh, fat and proteins useful things. Um, I wonder if you have some uh, insight. I, I know that you are going to do the experiment, but do you have uh, some insight as to like how these two interact, whether they inhibit each other or promote each other? Um, is there any um, so, signal coming I, out from your experiment already? So um, when you increase, the, the, the thing is slightly more complicated because than, than what I put down. I mean, there is an extra player um, in, in the room, and that is uh, non-photochemical quenching. So uh, the first thing that um, one should realize, I think, which for me was a surprise, is that uh, plants don't really want as much light as they can get. They want the correct amount of light, which is not the same. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out that uh, the photosynthetic, um, photosynthetic um, uh, pathways can be... Um, can be overwhelmed by too much light. And this is deleterious for, for plants because uh, they tend to generate um, reactive oxygen. Mm -hmm. So uh, the plants have developed a thing that's called non-photochemical quenching, which is essentially is a suite of different, uh, uh, different biochemical activities uh, that manage to reduce the absorption of, of light. Okay, but this, for example, in higher plants is related to or is, is accompanied by the fact that uh, they can reorient the chloroplast as well. So they actually also can physically have a slower, a lower cross section. Okay, so in terms of uh, algae, what we believe is going to happen is that this non photochemical quenching plays together with negative phototoxins. Okay, so they manage to, um, uh, they act on different timescales. So what often what you, what you do observe is that when you turn on the light, the cells, uh, first they, they do negative phototaxis, and then after a few minutes they revert and they do positive phototaxis, but the, you have not changed the light, okay? So in a sense, um, you need also to take into account uh, non-photochemical quenching. So this means that you need to do different measurements of chloroplast activity with fluorescence in a slightly different way. Now, chloroplasts, uh, as you know, uh, during photosynthesis, they, they develop, uh, they produce ATP and they produce um, uh, redox power, if you want. So the ATP, we know already that it uh, changes flagellar, flagellar activity. Okay, so it manages, for example, to increase uh, the beating frequency of, uh, of flagella. So this would be, uh, would feed into um, uh, set, uh, photokinesis already. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, more than this, actually, I'm sorry, but I don't know because uh, um, photokinesis is not enough because photokinesis mm -hmm. would actually give you, if anything, uh, negative phototaxis, okay, or, yeah, well, a negative uh, flow because it would diffuse away from regions where you go faster and into mm -hmm. regions where you go slow, which is definitely not what happens, okay? Uh, what I can tell you that I didn't tell here is that if you look at individual cells, they, to, they tend to come in towards light, they spend a little bit of time there, and then they move away. Okay, and then I don't know because we have not done experiments on a wide screen enough or a wide field of view enough. I don't know whether those same cells actually then after a while they come back, and then there is this sort of flipping, uh, flip flopping behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so I think one needs to realize the fact that there is no such a thing, or there doesn't appear to be such a thing as an optimal light intensity for, for phototaxis. So this probably mm -hmm. is connected to the way that the cell uses uh, or modulates its metabolism. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I cannot be more specific because we haven't done enough experiments yet. Yeah. Thank you. That's very insightful.